As somebody once declared, that's why they play the games. And I really did not understand going into the game the lack of respect for Kentucky football and the assumption that Ole Miss would not only win this game, but would run away with it. Vegas, 17 and a half points and going up and up and up and up based on the response by the public. But Kentucky wins in Oxford 20 to 17. No big surprise to me. Did I believe Ole Miss was going to win? Yes, but I really considered a Kentucky upset and I certainly took the Wildcats with those points. I grabbed them in a hurry. Let's get to this one. It was fun. This is one of the great reasons why we love college football. It's somewhat unpredictable. Not completely unpredictable like some would say, but it is mighty unpredictable and we have another double digit upset and we are far surpassing the total from 2023. Trey Harris This Ole Miss offense with Jackson Dart running the show. Trey Harris had another remarkable game. He is a freakish athlete, and he has turned into possibly the best wide receiver in college football. 11 catches for a buck 76 and a touchdown. He came into this week as the number two wide receiver in yards per game in college football. And Jackson Dart was number one in the nation against four weak opponents, of course. That was the narrative coming in. Ole Miss had the big season last year at 11-2, brought back so much talent, picked up so much talent through the transfer portal, Henry Parrish, Walter Nolan, and others, that they were just loaded and ready to compete with the big boys in the SEC. But again, the four light opponents out of the gate really proved nothing. And now they would take on the SEC opener in Kentucky against a team that... Let's take it to the opposite end of the spectrum. Kentucky's already played a really good South Carolina team where they melted in the second half and lost 31-6 to as a 10-point home favorite. And then Kentucky played that remarkable game, tough game where they outplayed Georgia in the trenches but lost 13-12. to Mark Stoops not going for it on fourth and seven. We'll get to that in just a second. So, Kentucky battle-tested Ole Miss not, but Ole Miss just with all that offensive firepower and Kentucky is challenged offensively and they're conservative and just people overplay these narratives. They're true, but when you look at NFL talent on these two rosters, it's, it's pretty close. And no big surprise that Kentucky hung in there and again, they pull out the win. But we knew that Kentucky would suppress the score, take the air out of the football, try to shorten the game, and that Ole Miss would obviously try to press the action. And they wanted a score above the 53 over under. Uh, Kentucky got their way in this uh, game that totaled 37 points. So the under won it. Pete Golding called Trey Washington, the Ole Miss veteran defensive back, the smartest player he's ever coached. Think about that. Pete Golding coached at Alabama, of course, among other stops. All right, let's take it to the fourth quarter. And at this point, Ole Miss was down 10 to 7. They took the lead at 13 to 10. And this was the moment of truth because again let's go back rewind a couple weeks to Lexington and a fourth and seven around midfield Kentucky had the option of punting the football relying on the defense to make a three and out get the ball back in better field position to kick the game-winning field goal against Georgia they of course opted to punt the football and never got it back when they should have gone for it. We said that in the moment, even hindsight is 2020. Was it a horrendous, blown coaching decision? No, it's a debatable coaching decision. But Mark Stoops has caught hell for that coaching decision and the second guessing surrounding that game. The narrative coming out of the game was, number one, is Georgia really as good as we thought they were as the best team in the country? And number two, why did Mark Stoops not go for it on fourth down when you've got a chance to pull off a 22-point upset? But they didn't. That has haunted Kentucky. They won the game against Ohio last week. So... Trailing by three points late in the ballgame at their own 30-yard line. Fourth and seven. Kentucky goes for it. (laughs) They don't go for the logical fourth and seven play against Georgia at home, but they go for it on the road deep in their own end in which they could have lost the football game, of course, right there if Ole Miss scores the touchdown and goes up by two scores. But Brock Vandenberg-Griff goes up top. 
plays his best game of his young career, you got to say, especially with this throw in the clutch. Up top to Varian Brown, a beautiful throw over the defensive back, Isaiah Hamilton, and the push off by Brown was timed perfectly, not called. Don't necessarily know that it was offensive P.I., but close, could have been called, has been called in the past. And that was the score, obviously, that got the play that that turned this entire game around. That was the play of the game. But there were other plays of the game coming. Gavin Wimsett comes in at quarterback. He's, of course, the Redkers transfer, who's the running quarterback, took in the Wildcat uh, down near the goal line and was fighting for extra yardage down near the one-yard line. And the ball pops loose. And whoop, Kentucky tight end. Josh Caddis was in the right place at the right time. The ball fell right into his arms, and he scored the touchdown. And Kentucky led this one. Uh, and meanwhile, that smartest player, the peak holding, the Ole Miss defensive coordinator said Trey Washington. Yeah, he was the guy that put the helmet on the ball to knock it loose and made what could have been the game-saving play for Ole Miss. But again, it bounced right to Caddis, and Kentucky scored the Go ahead, touchdown with 225 left, 20 to 17. Jackson Dart to Caden Priest scoring one of the best tight ends in the country and one of the most talented, only catch on the day. Kentucky shut him down, took him out of the game, and so many weapons for the Rebels as well, so many options. But a 42 yard play, an excellent basketball type catch for Priest scoring, uh, outgunning the defensive back on that play. Story and momentarily saved the day for Ole Miss with the big catch at the Kentucky 34. Jackson Dart, a couple plays later, he made a couple boneheaded plays. One, rolling to his left, waited too long for the receivers to break free and let the Kentucky defensive end sack him, almost lost the football, almost knocked him out of field goal range with that sack, should have gotten rid of the football because it was an early down. Also, a couple plays later, he then did the same thing. He rolled to his left, didn't protect the football, and it was pried loose, and Kentucky recovered and would have won the game. However, Deion Walker, Kentucky's star defensive end, was offsides, giving Ole Miss new life. They drove it close, but Kentucky held, forced a long field goal. They talked about the analytics concerning this play. So yet you, you have about 52 seconds left in the game. Ole Miss is down 20 to 17. It's a fourth and seven. So you obviously kick the field goal. That's traditionally what you do. It's a 49 yard kick. You've got a decent field goal kicker, but he's not great. And Lane Kiffin doesn't like kickers and he doesn't like to kick. He wants to go for it. Caden Davis, of course, missed the field goal and Ole Miss loses the game. However, let's just... Survey the analytics here because it was brought up by Sean McDonough during the game broadcast about the analytics and that the analytics may say to go for it. And it seems ridiculous. You're down three. It's fourth and seven. That's a difficult, it's a do or die situation. You've got a 49 yard kick. You can tie the game. What's not taken into consideration there is that it's not the final play of the game. If it's the final play of the game, yes, that would lean you toward the field goal decision for sure. But that merely, that so, so you're banking on a 49-yard field goal make and also that you won't get the fourth and seven, which is probably a 30 to 47, 30 to 40% probability that you would get it. But also keep in mind that you're only tying the game with the main field goal and you're giving Kentucky or any team looking at the analytics 50 seconds to drive and just get in field goal range themselves. So the analytics might be a better play for the touchdown and going for it on fourth down than you would think. Just, just again, we got to get out of our traditional thought. I'm not saying that it was a bad decision by Lane Kiffin. I'm just saying that there's a alternative way to look at it. It's not just in a vacuum, that one play and tying the game. Again, if you score the touchdown, you basically win the game. If you convert the fourth down and then you go on to score the touchdown and maybe give Kentucky no time left, then you win the game, of course, versus simply kicking the field goal and you still give Kentucky the ball with a tie game. And even if you get to overtime, 
even if Kentucky can't move the ball, you have only guaranteed overtime. Actually, the more I talk it out, the more I'm trusting the analytics that you should have went for it on fourth and seven. That said, Kentucky wins the game 20 to 17. All right, I'm going to take it easy on Molly McGrath, but after the game, she said to Mark Stoops, this is the biggest win for Kentucky football since 1978. Okay, I understand the statistic is that this is the highest ranked road win for Kentucky since 1977 at number four Penn State. So maybe technically speaking, but this is not the biggest win for Kentucky since 1978. They have broken that long losing streak to Florida. They've won other games that has gotten them to nine and ten wins. They've won bowl games against good programs like Penn State and other teams. This is not their biggest win. They're one and two in the SEC. It's a big win. It's an unexpected win as a 17 or 18 point underdog, but that's a ridiculous statement. Biggest win since 1978. No, it's not. All right, Kentucky, they go to three and two. One and two again in the SEC. They've got a bye, then they've got Vanderbilt. And knowing Kentucky, again, let's not box these teams into certain categories Because it's automatic to think, well, Kentucky, they just beat Ole Miss. They'll beat Vandy. (laughs) Vandy just went to Columbia and took Missouri to overtime. These games are toss-ups past the elite. For Ole Miss, disappointing loss. Of course, 10-2 and is probably the marker you have to get to to get to the college football playoff. So this is one loss, one unexpected loss. They've got to go to Death Valley. They've got some other difficult games. George is coming to Oxford. Uh, But a unanticipated in the preseason, offseason, difficult game next for Ole Miss. Going to Columbia, South Carolina to take on the Gamecocks, a game bunch of Gamecocks, 3.30 Eastern time next Saturday. Your thoughts about Ole Miss football, Kentucky, the decisions that had to be made right here at the Voice of College Football. Please leave those comments and questions below and catch us throughout the day with instant analysis and, of course, the big post-game call-in show on Saturday night after the primetime games right here at the Voice of College Football.